and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 248 at block height 661,229 on Sunday, December 13th. What is up, Janine? Well, I had a interesting weekend. <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit of shenanigans. But I fixed the situation and uh, opened my own Jitsi thing and probably, I mean, I haven't heard back about <laughs> doing a redo, so no idea, but uh, just I'm probably going to record my video because that is the last, that is what I did the last time I tried to go to an event that didn't work out. I just recorded my own talk and it went, so probably will do that. And then I have one coming up on the 21st, which I think would be after another episode of Block Digest anyway, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So I am getting extremely agitated right now. I'm staring at a random tweet on Twitter that I can't talk about because if I talk about it and then we put this on YouTube, we're going to get in wrong think trouble. Oh no. I thought I thought we already lived in wrong think land. But they explicitly said that you can't talk about this wrong think. Otherwise, kabosh. Fun times. So let, let's let's just touch on a little little uh, different uh, case of wrong think that that's not explicitly categorized yet. So, um Kind of interesting that the day before tomorrow, a list of 2 million registered CCP agents leaks into the public, showing placements at, uh, I don't know, places like the, the UK consulate in Shanghai, at Boeing, at Pfizer. K kind of really interesting how that just goes out of, out of nowhere right before Kamal <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry I, I mean Joe um you know get get certified just just think that's a little interesting just just, just a, a a curious note I mean is anyone shocked that a major world power would want to install sympathetic agents to do it around the world. I can think of another major world power that does a similar thing, but oftentimes they're a lot more explicit with it. They just like to put their military boots on the ground everywhere and kind of declare every country a de facto uh, zone of the war on terror. Yeah, and we, we shouldn't do that. You know, just like uh, the CCP shouldn't put two million spies all over the place. See, the, the cool thing, though, about um, the agents of this other power is that you don't have to get someone to, like, leak a list uh, to some journalists. All you got to do is uh, find one of their fitness apps, which literally draws maps of where they're all going. And that app is still up and running and people are using it. And it's uh, in the past, it showed the locations of secret military bases. So... No need to leak a list of people. We, you can just literally follow them around everywhere. Yep. But, you know, just, just to kind of wrap, wrap, wrap this up on my end, um, let's just say that I predict a lot of things that a month or two ago um, were completely baseless things, according to the media, uh, might not be so baseless um when come on i'm sorry i i mean joe um get get certified 
if you catch my drift. What, are we going to declare uh, our loyalty to the red flag or something? Oh, no, I, ju I just think that, you know, Joe might have to, um, you know, make up some, some kind of medical problem um, soon if, if things get dug up of, of a certain nature. I see. Well, purely on aesthetic purposes, uh, I'm not sure which, which flag looks nicer. I would definitely say that the current flag has more colors and shapes, so maybe we should stick with that one and maybe we can ask them to keep it, but it's not my decision because I am definitely not in either of those places. So There is only one flag in my mind, the Kekistani flag. There's only one flag in my mind, the black flag. Pirates unite. Oh, okay, one last silly thing. Um, so I saw a tweet by Dan Kaminsky that was gold the other day. And it is pr pretty much if, if you can convince people who don't want to wear masks to wear eye patches, then 2021 can be the year of pirates versus ninjas. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess uh, I guess that would at least protect them from a virus in their eyeball. Um. All right, all right. S silly memes aside, um, I hear, Janine, that Bitcoin is now the currency of criminals. Is this true? Oh, God. Uh, I've never heard that one before. Where did that come from? I don't know. Where did it? This is shocking news news to me criminals use money anyway uh december 9th our good foes at the uh blockchain surveillance company elliptic published a blog post about privacy wallets gotta know your enemy right uh mr T tommy robbie claims <laughs> that's my nickname for him from now on uh claims that the chart below shows how criminals have shifted from using mixer privacy wallets over the past few years at least 13 percent of all proceeds of crime in bitcoin were sent through privacy wallets in 2020 up from two percent or up from just two percent the year before in 2020 this represented over 160 million dollars in bitcoin from darknet markets thefts and scams being laundered through privacy wallets now wait a second um yeah i mean i'm gonna have to read <laughs> Uh, as usual, I'm going to have to actually read the the study that this was pulled from. It, they apparently put out some kind of guide about like financial crime indicators and such. And so for them to just assume that any money that comes from or through a darknet market is inherently criminal, um, citation please, because everyone by now knows that, uh, first of all, the term darknet market doesn't mean crime across the board darknet market literally means a website <laughs> that allows you to buy things that is not indexed by google that is literally all that darknet market means it's not like it's not like booga booga land okay it's like a lot of the time maybe an onion service something like that doesn't mean that any crime was committed just because you use a website that is not indexed by google there's a lot of websites that aren't indexed by Google, um, including government websites. <laughs> so gonna have to do a fact check on that one, but I my base assumption would be that uh, any money that has gone through a darknet market, they automatically classify as criminal. Um, so that's great. I wonder how that holds up, but anyway, continued. Privacy wallets help their users to achieve just that, privacy. There are completely legitimate reasons to use mixers or privacy wallets, and financial privacy is a foundation of, an open, of any open society. However, the blockchain data shows that criminals have been quick to exploit this new tool and that this represents a growing challenge for regulators, law enforcement, and compliance professionals seeking to combat financial crime and crypto assets. Yes, it's, you know, it's a huge... It's a huge embarrassment that, you know, while they could be going after actual financial criminals like the ones at intelligence agencies and governments and all of, you know, the, uh, the cartels that the U.S. government knowingly cooperates with in order to get info on other cartels, 
uh, stuff like that. You know, they could be going after those people, but they're really failing on the still tiny, tiny market of crime that's using cryptocurrencies. It's so embarrassing. Anyway, blockchain analytics tools still provide valuable insights for compliance professionals at crypto asset exchanges and financial institutions. The fact that a customer has used a privacy wallet is itself useful information, even if the ultimate source of funds cannot be determined. This insight can be used to, tr to trigger enhanced due diligence on the customer source of funds in a similar way that a large cash deposit at a bank might trigger additional checks. Unless, unless the large cash deposit is being made um, at a bank with specifically wide enough, uh, you know, kiosks where they can push it through and they can say, no, I am approved by <laughs> the government to do this. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so this insight uh, to trigger enhanced due diligence, well, you don't say, because um, it turns out a person, UTXO XO, shared a project called Comply First, which seems to be a collaboration between DV Chain, Cypher Trace, Tari, and Stoic Capital, lovely bunch. And it says they create compliance, guidance, and resources around privacy preserving cryptocurrencies such as Monero and Zcash, and the increasingly uh, increasing privacy technologies being planned, discussed, and deployed in projects such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and one of those resources is actually a questionnaire for due diligence. Joy. So yeah, they say that uh, we aim to educate and support various members of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, including exchanges, wallets, custodians, developers, researchers, and more on supporting these valid, valuable, and rapidly emerging technologies in a responsible manner that satisfies their compliance obligations. And one of the resources, which they only just published on December, for seventh is example privacy feature enhanced to due diligence questionnaire and this is available as a very convenient pdf that they recommend to not to be sent in its entirety to customers it actually says one of the pages should not be sent to customers but of course if you are a person who has the internet you may be a customer and you can access this document anyway and get to know ahead of time what they may send to you uh, and this is recommended for custodians uh, who suspect that they have a customer who has used privacy enhancing tools for their Bitcoin. And it says our service, uh, this is in the questionnaire that I believe may be just a template for them to actually send to a person, but it says our just takes the responsibility of only uh, accepting clean coins that are not related to any illegal or undesired activities. Seriously, key keywords there to any illegal or desired activities, undesired. Desired. So, what what is undesired, Shinobi? It's bad. It's it's anything where we can't see everything. It's bad. Bad transaction. Yeah, the, yeah that basically means um, things that we don't desire. So, anything anything this exchange or custodian doesn't like, even if it's perfectly legal, like you, I don't know, bought sex toys or I don't know, just anything they don't like that you should be allowed to under normal circumstances buy and you would not get in trouble. If a woman buying, is allowed but... to buy a vibrator free of shame, men should be able to buy a flashlight. Okay? I thought this was all about equal treatment. Keep your nose yes. out of my transactions. Uh, it continues. Our complaints monitoring or process has detected that you may be involved with enhancing activity <laughs> i almost feel like making that into a t-shirt could you would you should i mean would you buy a t-shirt that says our compliance monitoring service has detected that you may be involved with privacy enhancing activities <laughs> such <laughs> i would totally wear that shirt i uh, might start a t-shirt i might start bouncing design ideas around my head now well, you can always use that. Uh, oh my god, you should totally use the uh, the clusterfuck club logo that someone made that still hasn't been turned into <laughs> stickers. So the front the, the front says our compliance monitoring service has detected that you may be involved with privacy enhancing activities, and the back says welcome to the clusterfuck club. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. This is now a T-shirt. Thank you to you chain analysis bastards you have inspired a t-shirt um 
Anyway, such as mixing services, shielded transactions, or other unusual privacy-enhancing behaviors for your cryptocurrency network. As such, we ask that you complete this questionnaire to help us better understand the source of your funds and your motives for using advanced privacy-enhancing services or tools. Based on your responses, we may require additional supporting documentation or have follow-up questions. And some of the questions that they include... Um, as things that maybe this custodian might ask you is, if applicable, explain how you were, you acquired these funds and the sources of these funds. If applicable, explain how you spent or used these withdrawn funds. Uh, describe your process of using a privacy enhancing feature to the best of your ability. Describe why you are using a privacy enhancing feature. <laughs> what cryptocurrency address? <laughs> I can't, I can't read this. Um, it's like, Why? Because I'm buying a fucking sex doll and I don't want my wife to find out, you fucking dick shit. That's why. Fuck off and mind your own business. Okay, <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, what cryptocurrency addresses did you use before, after, before, during, after, as applicable, the privacy enhancing feature? Um... What cryptocurrency transactions were involved before, during, after, as applicable, the privacy enhancing feature? Yeah, so they want transactions and addresses. Um, if the privacy enhancing process was interactive, did you conduct due diligence, ergo collect IDs, physical addresses, etc., or otherwise owe any of the counterparties you <laughs> you interacted with to use this privacy enhancing feature? As in... Did you do your coin join completely wrong and ask to KYC <laughs> everyone who was participating? It's like I can't stop laughing. This is so bad. I don't know. Um, I'd like I'd like to know if they KYC'd everyone the last time they played a poker game at their buddies. I mean, dude, dude where'd that cash come from? Yeah. Where'd uh, where'd all those coins in your uh, in your kids' piggy bank come from? Those have to be accounted for every single cent. Anyway, there's still some more. Um, uh, if so, provide as much information as possible, including names and wallet addresses. Mm, yes. Do you intend to use these or similar privacy-enhancing features in the future? If so, why? Um, so essentially, this questionnaire summed up in a. In one sentence is, hey there, I see that you want privacy. Do you mind if I just turn that down notch and strip it away completely? Yeah. See, I don't ever deposit into a custodial entity anything larger than just completely normal amounts of money that you would be able to drop in cash in your bank without fucking with anything or any flags going off or being subject to anything. So personally, if I got anything like this, um, I would tell them eat a dick and I would go pay a lawyer to send a letter with nice letterheads about why they're asking me where something like $200 came from. Um, you know, considering the parallels of how that would work depositing that into a bank. You know, I, I feel like, uh, I don't know, there's so many different ways you control these people, especially if you didn't care about losing the money that they're questioning you about. And I would probably just say <laughs> something like, motherfucker, I am Satoshi. These are Satoshi's coins. Prove that they're not. No, I, I, I would be willing to throw a, a little money at a lawyer for stupid shit like that. And uh, I, I would not let that go. I mean, like, seriously, like, th that's crazy. Um just just freeze your money to ask where like a couple hundred bucks came from for something um i don't know dick shit um maybe i'm using this type of stuff because unlike a bank which is required by law to protect all the details of my finances from the general public um this kind of leaves it all out in the open and maybe when i go you know pay my buddy johnny um for some fucking money he loaned me for lunch and he goes on and sends that off to somebody else. Um, I don't want random jackass seeing how much money I have and going, Hmm, maybe I could rob that guy. Yeah. I, I feel like this is, this is like a new level of KYC. This is like, know your customers, friends, know your customers, uh, buddies. Like, I don't know. That feels like the angle they're going for. Yeah. I mean, it's like, 
that like massive insane article I wrote on the mempool at the start of this year, like looking at the next decade of how things play out, that there is a reason that I called a Supreme Court case over these types of privacy issues relating to Bitcoin probably sometime in the next decade. Because this is insane. Like the way that things work by default with Bitcoin versus a bank are the exact inverse. And it's really just a matter of time if they just start taking advantage of that to demand more and more information and just make it impossible to emulate the the type of public facing privacy that you have in a bank, then people are going to get hurt. People are going to lose your money. And, And this is going to wind up in court. Like this will eventually be litigated um, as far as like, hey, are you kidding me? I can't do this. I can't obscure things to the public. Look at these three guys who just got robbed or killed or however the hell that eventually plays out. Also, I mean, in some cases, if you're using the privacy tools correctly, you may not even be able to trace your own coins back to whoever sent them to you, especially if they were given to you by someone who doesn't have a, uh, who hasn't given you a name or a physical, like who the hell goes around like taking physical addresses of people that they get money from? Like makes no sense. So in a lot of cases, people won't even be able to provide this information if they're doing it correctly. Mm-hmm. But I'm, like, I'm serious though, like just the personal risk to people. Like, I, I think it was the Netherlands, but you remember like a year or two ago, like, I think it was like three people broke into a man's house with his two year old daughter home and literally put a power drill in his leg, demanding access to his Bitcoins. So the, the government really wants to go there. They really want to ratchet this shit up as far as stripping away options for maintaining your privacy until shit like that starts happening here have fun with the pr game and the court cases that come out of that well i assume the way they're going to play that is oh well they had bitcoin that means they're kind of suspicious by default so we shouldn't care about them yeah i don't think that's gonna fly when you see some hard-working father um have a power drill shoved into his leg in front of his two-year-old daughter just because he happened to put his savings into a specific asset. Good luck with that. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would be the benefit of mainstream adoption is that you get a lot more regular people, regular in quotes, who have this stuff and are now going to be put at risk with policies like this. And I guess in a lot of cases, I mean, some of it they're already accustomed to if they're a documented banked person. I mean, there are people using Bitcoin who also use things like Venmo, which like is a social network for money and publishes tons of information about how you're using your money. And there's already been like media pieces that basically follow people and what they do based on their Venmo data that is public. Um... So, uh, I mean, maybe it'll take a while for anything extreme to happen like that, but um, it could. Yep. What do we have next? Well, um, kind of very topically related um, to the, and I I want to stress again, rumors, um, about Steve Mnuchin and the Treasury considering very restrictive self-custody um, regulations. Um, so Senator Warren Davis, uh, Tom Emmer, um, Ted Budd, and Scott Perry <laughs> um, have actually sent a letter to the U.S. Treasury specifically addressing these circulating rumors right now. And honestly, it's a pretty well-reasoned argument. I mean, the effective parallels here are just comparing things to cash and how things are slowly shifting more and more to a digital age. Um, And yeah, 
I mean, if if I can go pull cash out of the bank and hold that myself, why can't I pull my Bitcoin out of the bank and hold that myself? And just, yeah, kind of calling the rumors at least out as just very narrow-minded, short-sighted um, view on things that could be very damaging to the space and to people in the space. And he specifically um, references the fact that that so many people already self custody their assets and do so because it is a completely legal and lawful thing to do and brings up the question well if restrictive um regulations were to be passed i mean what about all these people are they all of a sudden criminals um would this open the door to their assets being seized or becoming illegitimate and it's just like yeah i mean yeah I keep saying this every time, you know, the, these rumors come up until I see something concrete from the treasury. The, these are just rumors and all of the kind of issues brought up by Mr. Davidson. Um, yeah. Like, how do you do that? Like, you, you can't just snap your finger over something like this and turn a bunch of people into criminals without massive massive fallout and complications from that so how are you going to handle that no idea also fuck steve mnuchin can't disagree there and also i i do have to say his wife just has a really creepy creepy vibe yeah well everyone in the doj has a creepy vibe i mean seriously like steve mnuchin is like one of the actors that created the situation that made a ton of people interested in something like Bitcoin. Um, so the fact that he's that he thinks that he's going to do anything that will get any of us on his side on this is insane. What? I'm s the market imploded. Sorry, guys. No house for you. Yeah, you know, j just on on that note, I am really kind of honestly shocked that with Mnuchin in charge of the Treasury, that the office of the Comptroller has been doing so many, like, arguably positive things as far as regulatory clarification go for this space. Like, that has just really boggled my mind. Yeah, I'll keep in mind that uh, Brian Brooks, uh, when he got uh, uploaded to the position of comptroller, um, he made a statement about how it doesn't make sense to allow people to wear masks in banks because, of course, we shouldn't allow people to do that. That's that's not acceptable. I know. I'm just saying, like, you, you could have kept this space in a much more precarious situation if they had not explicitly clarified that banks are allowed to custody and receive deposits and handle cryptocurrency or offer services to business in the space like you know what i mean that that was a really e even considering you know brian's position there that's a really weird thing given that Mnuchin's effectively at the top in that department. I mean, I can see from their perspective why it would be beneficial to allow regular banks to hold crypto assets because then that takes away kind of the uh, sparkle from these sort of not like these neo banks slash tech companies that are doing it instead. Like it gives some of the control back to a system and actors that they're used to already. So I don't see it as like a okay. benevolent act. Yeah, that is definitely a very solid point. But anyway, fuck the government. Guess what yeah. cool thing happened? What? So uh, Chris Belcher on the 8th of December um, has accomplished the first stepping stone towards an actual coin swap implementation on Testnet. So he has conducted the first um kind of multi-transaction um, coin swap on testnet um, 
kind of routing through the amounts. So for anybody who doesn't remember that part of the proposal, um, coin swap kind of doesn't do much if you and I just take an exactly one Bitcoin denominated output and then put it into a coin swap address and then pull them out at the same time in parallel. Um, that gets kind of obvious. Um, so his proposal to deal with that was kind of fragment things across multiple different transactions, um, breaking up the amount um, compared to the entire total being coin swapped. So that just looking in the block, you can't really fingerprint that going on because it's all broken into random uneven amounts um, during the transactional hops. And so actually built out at least the part of the system working on transaction construction and deployed the first test on testnet so this is a uh, pretty pretty cool um <clears throat> so from here um i think the next step is probably going to be actually working on the ecdsa um, two-party implementation because this test just used um vanilla multi-sig addresses that you can tell are multi-sig um but yeah um once that is worked out then it pretty much just comes down to i think at least big picture wise implementing the coordination mechanism for makers and takers to interact with each other but uh yeah hopefully um by this time next year there will actually be an implementation out there with some use on mainnet and so I think it's right back into the stinker pile of stupid government. Stupid government. So what the hell are these douchebags at FinCEN potentially doing? What are, they, what are they trying to do here? Well, sort of related to why the idea of filling out that questionnaire should scare you, um, on December 10th, FinCEN put out a news release titled Director Blanco Emphasizes Importance of Information Sharing Among Financial Institutions under Section 314B of the U.S. Patriot Act. And as part of publishing the prepared remarks for the ABA's Annual Financial Crimes Enforcement Conference, sounds fun, uh, it was uh, also accompanied by a fact sheet um, which I think has been updated from the previous one and asserts that Section 314B of the U.S. Patriot Act provides financial institutions with the ability to share information with one another under a safe harbor that offers protections from liability in order to better identify and report activities that may involve money laundering or terrorist activities. Now, key, key part there. The uh, safe harbor that offers protections from liability is lawyer speak for if something bad happens as a result of them sharing this identifying personal information about your financial activity, you can't do anything about it. Um, they are not responsible for anything that happens, um, which is great, isn't it? Uh, furthermore, participation in information sharing pursuant to Section 314B is voluntary. Of course it is. It's always a great time when the government uses that word to mean the opposite of what it means. But uh, yep. fin FinCEN strongly encourages financial institutions to participate. Um, however, to uh, rely on Section 314B, Safe Harbor, a financial institution or an associ association of financial institutions need not have specific information indicating that the activity in regards to which it proposes to share information directly relates to proceeds of an SUA, um, which was defined at uh, an earlier point. I'm just picking out quotes that are important. Uh, I think uh, I might have to check that. Do you remember what it is? I do not. Oh, okay. Specified unlawful activity. Yes, that is a interesting term. So proceeds of a specified unlawful activity or to transactions involving the proceeds of money laundering nor must a financial institution or association have reached a conclusive determination that the activity is suspicious. Instead, it is sufficient that the financial institution or association has a reasonable basis to believe that the information shared relates to activities that uh, 
may involve money laundering or terrorist activity, and it is sharing the information for an appropriate purpose under Section 314B and its implementing regulations. So this is quite interesting. So, you know, in, in the U.S., there's a standard of law called, you know, reasonable suspicion, uh, which I don't think this uh, suspicious activity, like filing a suspicious activity report, I don't even think you need to have reasonable suspicion for that, but they're still using the word suspicion, so you might be tricked. Um, so you have the standard of reasonable suspicion, uh, then you have suspicion, and then you have something below that, which they are encouraging uh, to be the standard, which is, uh, what word did they use? Has a reasonable basis. So like reasonable basis, very, very low standard, apparently. Um, for doing this. And then it says a financial institution or associ association may also share information on attempts to engage in transactions that the financial institution or association suspects may involve money laundering or terrorist activity. What does that even mean? What What is an attempt to make a transaction? Does that mean like you, you like put in the information, like you fill in uh, the, the payment information and somehow they are able to see you do that? And then you don't do it, or does that mean you actually try to send the transaction and these people block it? And technically, you haven't made the transaction because they blocked it, but it's an attempt. Is that what they mean? I don't even know. I mean, th this is just so stupid, so backwards, so moronic in the 21st century. Uh, like the, the one of the few quotes from this um, that stands out in my head is bringing up um how how this helps banks figure out suspicious things such as i mean let's say i have a savings account at one entity and a checking account at another um well sharing information more freely will allow you to figure out if somebody is being suspicious like behaving differently with different accounts at different institutions um, so yeah, I mean, when I behave wildly differently with a savings account and a checking account, I mean, am I going to get flagged as a money launderer? Cause I'm behaving differently with these different accounts. Wait, so they're saying that, you know, it's good that they share information about you so that they can then find material that makes them suspicious that you may be involved in criminal activity. Wait, isn't that the kind of thing that the Fourth Amendment is supposed to give a big no-no on? That you're not supposed to search first, then get the warrant <laughs> for to, to make uh, the evidence that you found during this illegal search uh, legitimate um that seems to be a bit backwards mm -hmm. in, in spirit most absolutely yeah so i mean for non-americans um i mean it's called the u.s patriot act but literally if you look up any literature about the effects of the u.s patriot act and how it actually works it is the complete opposite of <laughs> something that an actual patriot would agree to because if you remember the term patriot uh during the american revolution was used for people who were standing up to the british government for searching people's houses and commandeering their houses for military purposes without the permission of the homeowner so it's literally an act that does the thing that the that patriots fought against when this country was when the u.s was founded like it's a it's just a giant mind fuck dude george orwell wrote the most amazing manual ever yes i have heard <laughs> although to be honest you know uh i mean uh, televisions that watch you i mean that's so that's so 2016 yeah and I mean, you know, I, I really am feeling a theme and a title and an image coming all together in my head right now. But th this really does just circle back to um, the, I think the government just wants to get a power drill shoved in all our knees. I mean, like, really, are, are we going to just keep 
ignoring in the 21st century how often data is compromised all this information that they're collecting is is grabbed by third parties and put to who knows what use i mean what wasn't it just um in the last few years the the chinese military literally compromised equifax one of the biggest financial data sets on american citizens ever i mean fuck the u.s treasury just got hacked today <laughs> yay Excuse me, Mr. Government Man, my Liberty Analysis Service has determined that you are engaging in enhanced interrogation activities. <laughs> but it's like... Please, please fill out this questionnaire about why you are trying to destroy our freedoms. But it, it's like, seriously, though, like, throw aside the, the constitutional arguments, the arguments about rights, throw, throw all of that aside for a minute. Are we still going to keep refusing to have the the purely practical conversation about whether this type of shit um keeps people safe and keeps them from being at risk or just um you know contributes to keeping them unsafe and puts them at more and more risk the more and more that this shit happens i mean to just just to really boil it down regardless of anybody's philosophical views on these things are are we really going to just keep pretending that's not a conversation we have to have just on purely logical grounds yeah and to go even further um they say that while institutions should maintain security they don't explain that they say section 314b and its implementing regulations impose no limitations on the sharing of personally identifiable information under the section 314 safe harbor as other whereas otherwise consistent with section 314b and its implementing regulations nor do section 314b or its implementing regulations impose restrictions on the type or medium of information that can be shared in uh, in reliance on the Section 314B Safe Harbor, such as video surveillance footage or cyber-related data such as IP addresses. So, like, they're literally saying, hey, collect it all. Like, literally, they just should have, like, lawyers, you don't have to be so wordy. Just, like, shorten it, just say collect it all. It already matches, you know, one of your other uh, surveillance programs, so it should be familiar to you. Um, but yeah, in terms of the Coindesk article, uh, there was a lot of commentary from various people about this, including compliance officers, and some of them were actually not too happy about this. And it says, FinCEN is encouraging people to engage in more data sharing, says Michael Yeager, a shareholder at the law firm of Carlton Fields, who focuses on government investigations and cybersecurity matters. They are doing so in a var variety of ways, including pointing out that finan a financial institution does not need to have made a conclusive determination that activity is suspicious or closely tied to a specific, uh, specified unlawful activity, an institution need not have concluded a SAR must be filed. So, I mean, that should make it clear. This is stuff for which they wouldn't even file a suspicious activity report for. Like, it's not even at that, ba <laughs> at that baseline of suspicion. Uh, but they will share it anyway. Um... And we know what happened to those SARS, didn't we? Uh, it got, they got leaked. Uh, and uh, another quote, um, this has led to what one compliance officer called an avalanche of data because financial institutions have been filing more and more to FinCEN. Many questions about the safety of the information collected by FinCEN, as well as the Bureau's failure to provide clear guidelines regarding how and when it eventually deletes the data does remain unanswered. So there is no recommendation about the limits on the type of information that can be shared or how much or how it is shared or how it is stored or even when it has to be deleted like nothing there is no consideration for privacy or security in here at all like you're they're literally just telling the banks collect it all and that's it like no no safeguards yep and even worse, they're saying, you know, we've given you no guidelines for privacy or security, and if you fuck it up massively, you get off scot-free. You have no liability. Like, what kind of why? What kind of person thinks that this is an accept acceptable deal? Except for the banks, obviously.
and the government. It's just like... I just really wonder if th- this whole issue is just going to be completely ignored until it culminates in something a lot worse than Equifax um, that actually has material consequences for people, not just informational ones. Because it's just like no matter how many fucking times these data silos get compromised, it just keep making them bigger. Come on, we got we got to fill them up more. Yeah, and um, I mean, this kind of thing, I mean, obviously no one is safe from this because literally it says anything you do (laughs) could potentially, if it like even slightly triggers your bank to look at you, um, you could be part of this and your information might get shared. But this just makes me want to really just like avoid avoid using banks as much as possible, which I already do. Like I, I use them very minimally and I'm going to keep doing that and... I'm not even doing it because I'm trying to hide anything in particular. I just want to buy groceries without, you know, a camera shoved up my ass every step of the way because, I don't know, I want to get banana chips or something. (laughs) Like, leave me the fuck alone. Yep. Sorry to all the carnivores out there for me saying banana chips. And Janine's canceled. Oh, no. Well, if you're worried about being canceled and you want to join the canceled club, come to my talk, Financial Cancel Culture. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. We ready for something that I at least have not seen in the spotlight for quite a while? Yes. So Rootstock is uh, making some changes to the architecture of their system. Um the merge mined um, Ethereum port Bitcoin side chain. So, mm. yeah, um, TLDR on Shinobi's view on this. Um, everything in Bitcoin terms that pegs into this side chain is pegged in through a multi sig federation, just like Liquid. So I ask, um, What's the point of of having miners involved in this, creating centralization pressures that's any real improvement over a federated block signer? I don't know. Um, But they're doing it. And they finally acknowledged, given the federation peg-in mechanism, um, that hardware security modules should probably be part of the security model there. Um, and so what they're doing, um, is effectively rolling out these HSM modules with a, um, a new logic related to the merge mind aspect of things. Um, they're calling these POW HSMs and the people who run them pegnatories. Um, like this is just, this whole thing and these terms just reek to me of just advertising buzzwords because really the reality of this is um, the HSM is designed to get a SPV proof out of the RSK sidechain and the HSM will not sign a withdrawal transaction on the main chain until um, you know there are 4,000 confirmations on the sidechain um, and there is an SPV proof for that. Um, this is somehow supposed to magically make the merge mining make sense, um, but I really don't see how in any way, given that it's all still a federation handling the peg with hardware security modules. I don't see how in any material way having that HSM verify 4,000 confirmations from miners versus 4,000 confirmations um, from a federation just signing blocks. It's just an HSM looking at a proof going in and refusing to sign something corresponding on the main chain until that proof is fulfilled. Everything still boils down to the HSMs enforcing everything and the operators of that keeping key backups secure. 
and that federation not colluding amongst themselves to steal everything. So really, it's th this just is another thing um, in the history of rootstock that just makes no sense to me in actual practical security terms and just seems like a, a big marketing attempt. Um, but at the end of the day, at the very least, um, this upgrade will have the Federation, you know, working off hardware security modules. So that's at least a step up compared to just running keys on a machine somewhere. But yeah, um, you know, th this is just an example to me of silly engineering based on rationalizing a prior roadmap, which involved actual consensus changes for merge mine side chains, which probably just aren't going to materialize. Um, so yeah, um, TLDR, um, rootstock is rationalizing miners being involved and subjected to centralization pressures in terms of incentives for, um, no other reason that I can see except not getting egg on their face, just switching off to block signers. Yeah. It's almost like in every form, everywhere that Ethereum goes, in any way, just software, architecture, the actual token, it's just a Rube Goldberg machine. Yep. So speaking of Rube Goldberg machines, um, I hear that Intel has a, a big use case coming for a super secure device. Janine, that was an SGX joke. Yeah, sorry, my cat, my cat just threw up in reaction oh, to risk. No. Oh no. Anyway, yes. Uh, <laughs> to go to a story that kind of makes me throw up. Um, Almost three years ago, uh, three years ago today, or two, or three years ago to the day on December 16th, uh, wait, <laughs> let me start over. <laughs> I'm freaked out by my cat's puke. Almost three years ago to the day on, on December 16th, 2017, uh, well, fi uh, time flies when you're shit talking, I covered the reveal of MobileCoin in Block Digest episode number 64, when we were still in the double digits. And I went over the white paper and the Wired article that announced it. If you want to know the details, uh, check out that episode or my tweet thread from that time, because I will not go over it again. All you really need to know is, assuming they haven't made any significant changes, which I haven't seen, um, it was supposed to basically be a copycat of Monero and Stellar. The white paper said that transactions are designed to employ a crypto note one time uh, address and one time ring, ring signatures, which is what Monero uses. Uh, so MobileCoin will still maintain transaction privacy through unlockable addresses if an attacker is able to defeat SGX and view transactions on the network. It also only works with Intel SGX. Essentially, that is where the data is stored in an SGX enclave. In fact, according to the new GitHub repo, you can't even run a validator node on the mobile coin network without using SGX. It says you can run the consensus service using Intel SGX in simulation mode. However, you will not be able to participate in consensus, in consensus with other validator nodes. Your software measurement will be different from hardware enabled Intel SGX peers and remote at attestation will fail. Hmm. That sounds like a absolutely terrible design. You're telling me you can't validate the state of the chain unless Intel SGX is involved? That sounds like a trusted third party to me. You're getting different measurements for the state of the network without using Intel SGX. That sounds like a terrible design. <laughs> Proof of Just Intel. Saying. Yeah, basically. Um, We've covered the problems with relying on SGX a number of times, and there have been several vulnerabilities shared over the years since then, so I don't think I need to go into why that's not a great idea. 
Uh, the Medium announcement post also says, please note that the mobile coin wallet is not available for download or use by U.S. persons or entities, persons or entities located in the U.S., or persons or entities in other prohibited jurisdictions. Of course, they, they don't list them, but it's point out, first and foremost, that if you're an American or in the U.S., you cannot use mobile coin. Um, the tweet sharing the beta of the mobile coin wallet also says, please note, the mobile coin desktop client is not for use inside of the United States. Please see the terms of use in the app for further considerations. I find these kinds of restrictions hilarious because as a developer of a mobile app, surely they know that even if they are restricting the app to only work on a phone that has uh, a SIM card from other than the US country, or won't let it connect to a US network, um, all someone has to do to get around this is get a non-US SIM card and turn on a VPN. I am <laughs> probably going to look into whether they have implemented any kind of analysis or restrictions directly in the app related to that, or if it's just a soft ban, kind of like how HODL, HODL said, you know, not in the US market. Not for Americans. Well, of course, that doesn't mean that Americans outside of the U.S. can't use it because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network that doesn't do KYC. So how are you going to know in the first place? That's a soft ban. Uh, I would be curious to know whether they've done anything to make this not a soft ban, such as KYC. I didn't see anything about that, but who knows? It wouldn't surprise me. But either way, um, yeah. So three years later, nothing fixed. Um... If anything, even worse, uh, so much for democratizing crypto. We Let's move on to an app that is not stupid. Woo woo! So um, in the last BTC Pay update, um, they made some changes uh, to the QR codes generated um, to try and save some space and make them a little more friendly for lower resolution devices. And they had to revert that cause they ran into a big boo-boo. Um, so pretty much, um, the, the URI, um, schema, um, I think it's a RFC from the IETF, um, is supposed to be case insensitive um, so that you can just, um, you know, go all caps, lower caps, whatever, and a client will parse the, the URI request properly. Um, and the change that BTC Pay made was shifting things to uppercase just because this helped make smaller QR codes um, easier for, you know, lower resolution devices, maybe pack more information in there and ran into a massive problem where um i think around like half of the wallets they're tracking at this point um actually implemented that feature incorrectly and not according to the the spec and so could not parse those qr codes and so they have a uh, pretty big effort for the last week going on on github um, going through and testing um all the different wallets they can track down for compatibility with this and trying to help work on um, fixing that. And really this is kind of just a uh, all across the board, um, like a lot of decent wallets and a lot of shitty wallets um, implemented this incorrectly. So uh, obviously uh, blockchain info can't support SegWit at all because they're incompetent morons. Um, but like Coinbase's wallet couldn't parse this correctly. Um, Electrum, Electrum on Android, um, the Ledger Live, um, Lightning Labs wallet, Mycelium, Samurai, Spectre, the Trezor wallet, um, the Zeus wallet for uh, hooking up to a C Lightning node. So yeah, th there is a, a pretty big spattering of wallets that couldn't handle this properly. So hopefully uh, with everybody involved in this effort, this can get sorted out and implementations corrected on all the different apps across the space. And then this can be flipped back on in a future release. Really just, just makes you think about how many massive 
like complicated specs have to be followed to build out little tools on the whole software stack that makes up something like a wallet and just a little goof up on something like this breaks compatibility. In addition to that, um, Lightning Pool has released a new alpha version of the Lightning Pool client. And uh, it's pretty much just a few bug fixes. Um, so when trying to close an account, it would throw an error um, for no order found. Um, that was fixed. Um, a few issues in terms of um, client startups, um, depending on the state of certain things in the database. Um, actually a typo in the command line interface and an issue with the REST server um, have all been fixed. So um, all those people out there listening who've been hacking away running lightning nodes since the very beginning and getting your hands dirty, go go play and go make the pool fun and great. Woo. Alrighty, and I guess last bit of news for the day. Um, we are now starting to see um, more big wigs jump into the space. So um, Massachusetts uh, Mutual Life Insurance Company, um, who has around $235 billion in their general investment account, um, bought $100 million worth of Bitcoin from a New York-based firm, um, NYDIG, which itself has 2.3 um, something billion dollars of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies under their management. So um, sorry that I cannot remember who said this, but um, as somebody on Twitter put it, um, an insurance company is buying insurance. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the founder and chairman of NYDIG um, also made a comment in the Wall Street Journal article on this that uh, Mutual is not the only insurance company that have been purchasing Bitcoin for their investment accounts through that firm. Um, yeah, so this is uh, something I've brought up a few times randomly um, when discussing the, these market sides of things is think about how um, you change the balance sheet dynamics of an insurance company if they are underwriting policies in dollars and put something like Bitcoin on its balance sheet. Um, you know, that, that really kind of changes the dynamic of inflows of money, how much money they're paying out for things, and how that really has to balance to be profitable or how that affects um, interest rates for people with policies. Um, or not, not interest rates, um, insurance premiums. So yeah, um, another class of the big money people have showed up at the door. Um, we've had hedge funds for years. Um, last year, we've had major university endowment funds. Um, this year, we've seen corporate treasuries start amassing Bitcoin. And um, also this year, we are starting to see insurance companies. Um, so for better or worse, in terms of how that affects attitudes about privacy or censorship resistance or open access, um, you know, the, just the ability to use it with no one stopping you and how those things evolve with all these people coming on board. Um, I really don't see at this point how anybody can deny that Bitcoin is just cementing itself deeper and deeper into the financial system as a thing you can't ignore. And however that goes in terms of Bitcoin's characteristics, um, it's happening. <laughs> like if you had told me a couple years ago, even that all of these things would be playing out in 2020, I would have called you bonkers <laughs> and said that you're thinking years and years ahead of time. But here we are. 
I wonder if they're going to get into chain analysis. I mean, they probably already are because, you know, they're an insurance company and that's what they do. If not, there's plenty of vendors out there. But it's just like, you know, <laughs> regardless of issues like that, like that once this just keeps dominoing and this asset winds up on all of these balance sheets for all these different reasons. I mean, that's just a spiral that I do not see how you stop. 2020s are going to be a wild ride, guys. All righty, Janine. That's a wrap. It's a final thoughts time. Your cat got anything to say? You know, maybe apologize for interrupting the show with his involuntarily bodily puking well excuse me first of all wrong pronoun she um <laughs> um did you just did you just gender your cat without asking it its opinion she is that's she. that's bigoted <laughs> you don't know if that's how that cat chooses to identify she nags a lot, so, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. You said that. I did not say that. You <laughs> said that. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, my final thought is that on December 11th, um, it was the last administrative hearing um, before the extradition decision for Julian Assange, uh, which is supposed to come on January 4th. We don't know uh, whether they will actually hold to that schedule, but that is currently the scheduled date. And yeah, so once again, I mean, it was an administrative hearing. Nothing substantial was supposed to happen. Um, Assange didn't even show up um, by choice because, uh, hello, the prison is still under COVID lockdown. Uh, to the point where um, apparently they are unable or unwilling, not sure which one, probably the second, uh, to give blankets out to prisoners during the winter uh, in a prison that is not, uh, I mean, if you've ever been to the UK, you should know that um, they don't really know what insulation is. They haven't really gotten to that um, that uh, point in the uh, evolu evolution of civilization yet. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I need to laugh because like, seriously, go, go to the UK and find me a house that has good insulation. <laughs> um, prisons, especially not going to be well insulated. Um, and so apparently the, uh, the temperature in a lot of the cells is basically freezing. Um, so that's happening. Uh, COVID lockdown where there's barely any, any interaction with human beings plus freezing. Um, it's basically a torture chamber. Um, and so it's completely understandable why he would not want to show up to court, uh, be woken up at some absurd time in the morning to be put in a van just to go to courtroom for not even five minutes. Uh, but weirdly enough, you know, despite nothing really happening, the judge once again was not really putting any effort into making the courtroom accessible for any part of this five minute period to be heard. And so people like Rebecca Vincent from, uh, I believe, one second, um, Rebecca Vincent from Reporters at Borders was one of the people that has been repeatedly trying to monitor the case, uh, especially back during the substantive part of the trial in September and has had a lot of issues just getting in um and that happened again this time and yeah basically uh, I, I don't even know really what the purpose of these hearings are um because literally it's just a it's one day a month where he's supposed to be dragged to court to say hi and be told he has to go back to prison until the next time he has to be brought to the court it's like thanks like, how much fuel are you wasting just to get everyone to this place for nothing to happen? Um, but yeah, uh, it's coming to be Christmas. Uh, the UK doesn't know what insulation is. 
there's a COVID lockdown, you'd think that that would be grounds for, I don't know, letting him go from this massive high security prison that is designed for violent terrorists, not people who write things and publish things. So yeah, he should be let go, as everyone apparently is now saying, like kind of late to the club for some of them, but I might as well say it now. Uh, now as good as time as any. And yeah, that's pretty much it, because nothing much is going to happen between now and the decision, and who knows what that decision will be. Um, hopefully they maybe come to a bit of sense and actually release him. Well, either that or, um, at least according to the media, Trump has been warming to the idea of pardoning Snowden. Um, if things continue going the way that they are, maybe just out of pure spite, he might extend that to Snowden. I mean, not Snowden, um, Julian. I mean, I have to say on the scale of urgency, um, the guy who is has multiple health conditions and in a freezing cell and is under threat of catching a disease that could kill him in a high security prison where he hasn't been able to even meet one of his own children ever in their life compared to the guy who is about to have a kid in a, you know, under, uh, in seeking citizenship, dual citizenship, apparently with a family in a, safe location i feel like one is more urgent than the other in terms of how we want to try to occupy the attention of the orange man but if someone wants to bet on both i mean why not well let's see but yeah on that note um i'm kind of plumb out of thoughts that will not get us kicked off of youtube so Hope everybody enjoyed. Catch you later, punks. This has been your session of Privacy Enhancing Activity. <laughs>